Steve Keen of Kingston University. He's acerbic. He is someone that each and every one of us has to listen to, whether we agree or disagree. Steve, I want to get to the crisis, Lehman, and where we are now. Rishir Sharma with a great essay this morning in the New York Times. But first, I want you to address our inequality now and this gilded age. Maria Ma Ma Mariana Mazzucato has a spectacular book out. The first 60 pages, Steve, are if they were written by you on economic history. She just does a clinic on economic history. Are we in a gilded age right now? We are certainly, Tom and Marianne. Is, uh, we're very, both good friends and very compatible in our thinking on that front as well. Uh, the level of inequality now, as, as Piketty pointed out in his uh, master book, uh, is now greater than at any time in history with possibly the sole exception of the Gilded Age. So yes, the inequality is driving both poor economic performance and the level of social conflict we're seeing. Is in a, this is a critical question, folks, for Global Wall Street. Is inequality driving the financial engineering that got us in a mess in 2004, 2005, and 2006? And Steve, I go back to Simon Johnson up at MIT and the idea in the summer of 2004 where the SEC allowed the banks to re-leverage up. Yes, I think it's actually a positive feedback, Tom, because the, the financial engineering is what's actually driven the inequality as well. And then the equality makes it worse until you get a breaking point, which is what 2007 was. But what the Federal Reserve has done quite foolishly by not understanding what caused the crisis in the first place is actually accentuate that crisis, that inequality, through quantitative easing, which has driven up share prices. Great if you own shares, uh, not so great if you don't. And of course, the vast majority of Americans own a trivial amount of shares. It's the wealthy have benefited. So the Federal Reserve has amplified the inequality caused by the crisis itself. Uh, uh, so you say this happens until breaking point. What is breaking point, Steve? Well, the breaking point is when the, the debt bubble, which actually drove the inequality, came to a crashing halt. You, you don't get this level of asset prices with that leverage driving up the asset prices. And American more, uh, private sector debt rose from about 50% what, one, about one, about of GDP to 170% over the post-war period. It hit the breaking point in 2007 and we saw a 20% fall on that debt level. That's what drove the market down, the plunge in credit drove the market down, which Bernanke and Co still don't understand. So that's what gave us the crisis. That was the breaking point. And what the Federal Reserve has done is actually tighten the rubber band once more. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens when quantitative tightening takes the place of quantitative easing. Okay, um, Steve, you also have a, you asked for a mortgage chart. Here it is. We're going to bring it up and talk to me about what that means. Let's see. Okay, this is one of several charts that to me simply explains what is still inexplicable to conventional economists, and that is what caused the bubble and what caused it to burst. And the, on the housing front, what gives you the fundamental core source of demand for housing is new mortgages. So what I'm relating there is new mortgages to the level of house prices. And you can see one and the other are completely overlapping. One drives the other. Mortgage credit drives house prices. And by letting mortgage debt get out of control, which is what the Federal Reserve did quite happily, over the 1990 to 2007 period. That's what caused the bubble and that's what ultimately led to the crash as well. well and when, when the peak of those two lines is when, when Greenspan told Congress there was no bubble. Okay, but, but, but Steve, where are we now? I mean, are we, are we setting ourselves up for another bubble? Norio Rabini was on doom and gloom yesterday. We're gonna get out to 2020 and the world's gonna end. Drew Mattis over at MetLife is saying, you know what, there's some validity to Trump growth. Which is it? Yeah, well, I think uh, I disagree with Norway on the world ending in 2020. I think there'll be a recession in 2020 oh, because the Federal Reserve doesn't understand this stuff still and is pushing up interest rates with no regard to the impact that'll have on forcing the private sector to delever, <clears> which will turn credit demand negative once more, but not on the scale of 2007 because we had credit demand peaking at 15% of GDP then. It fell to minus 6% during the crisis. It's recovered to about 5 to 6% now. It will fall from that level and that will cause Right. recession, which the Federal Reserve won't understand still, but it's not as bad as 2007. I mean, Steve, some of the people seeing you on here are going, why is that commie Marxist on here again? You know, they want, they're, you know, they're like, this guy's those left, and then this guy's to the left of Nancy Pelosi. But Steve, importantly, <laughs> we've, got a few, we've got a few elections going on where we've got a populist tone. What kind of populism are we seeing in Hungary or in Sweden or in whatever the next election is? Is, is it just authoritarian? or does it get back to something new? 
Well, it's ugly. This is the trouble. And I think Nick Hannah had a beautiful paper about this some time ago, saying if you want to uh, take over the centre of politics in America, you've got to move left, not right, because the vast majority of the population is to the left of, of Nancy Pelosi, not just me. Uh, the, the, if you have only a right-wing group putting forward policies, which include racist policies, xenophobia, uh, anti-migration and so on, they'll get the populist vote. If you have a progressive group putting forward similar policies in economics, but very different on migration and so on, they'll get the vote. You've got a choice. Do you want the, the black shirts or do you want uh, people to wear leather jackets occasionally? Okay, but uh, so, you know, let's leave all this kind of, you know, fighting talk to one side. What is the right economic policy for the world right now? The right policy should be reducing the level of private debt. This is what I've been arguing for a, more than a decade. What caused the crisis was too much private debt. Uh, what caused the golden age of American capitalism was a low level of private debt. We have to get back to that level and use the state's How? capability. We could, the government has done QE. A trillion dollars a year was created to boost American share prices by buying bonds off American financial corporations. That same amount of money could have been created by the stroke of a pen, put into households and used to reduce household debt and get them to buy corporate shares, democratizing share ownership right. rather than... That's pension funds, right? Uh, 401ks, I mean, everybody owns no, shares. That's a trivial... In pension funds. Everybody owns, but a trivial amount is owned by the working class, a huge amount is owned by the rich. Let's, let's think of this joke that 401k means America's a, a capitalist democracy. It's still a capitalist oligarchy. And by increasing the share prices, you benefit right. those who own the majority of shares. Steve, where are you on the theory that the reason we're not seeing wage growth all in is because we've incentivized the elites with various equity incentives, capital gains treatment and such, and almost on a dollar for dollar basis, if the system gives the wage growth back to labor, it comes off the hide of the elites. Do you like that idea? Or can we, with productivity, actually grow wages? Uh, I think we've, we've mistaken where the money is going. I wouldn't mind the money going to the Elon Musks and even the best Jeff Bozos of the world. It's going to the financial sector as well. And they're the rentiers. They're not the creators of capitalism. So I think we can actually boost what the workers get. And it comes out of the pockets of the financial speculators, not out of the industrialists. In fact, they'd see that money coming back in. What they pay it through the back door, they'd see coming in through the front door because workers spend virtually everything they earn.